Well, good evening, good morning, good night, wherever you're at, however you're doing. I hope it's good. I hope you get an upgrade here. Uh, welcome to episode number eight of Revelations from the Courtroom of Heaven. I'm Aaron, and we're here moving on. So where we left off last time, you guys, we let you guys really loose with God. You were contending with God in the court of calling, and you were allowing him to excavate you're allowing him to judge the deep things in you that you don't know are there. Maybe there's a little hint of this, a hint of that. But the, what were those things? They were bad things that the enemy could have access to. They were storehouses of negative things that the enemy had access to. We went to God. We said, God, judge these things. They're not good for me. I can't have them in my life because they're displeasing to you. And so what happens? That was a Kickstarter for all kind of things to happen. Now, you may notice when you get God to judge on a matter that's in your soul, he may start rerouting your life. He may start bringing these things up from your soul, showing you them, and then you get to deal with them. So it's kind of like know what you're asking for, but know that God will make a quick work if you surrender and are there with him. Now, behind all those things, as we talked about, there's demonic rights that were being destroyed. When you get God to judge on your behalf, there's all kind of things that are put in motion, all kind of verdicts from his courts. They don't only go into your life, they go into hell and they go into the enemy's camp. And I want to tell you guys about a court called the court of meeting, the court of meeting. So the court of calling you and God judging the things in your heart, the court of meeting, you bring verdicts that God, that God has already rendered in your favor, such as from the court of calling. You said, God, judge this thing. So God's like, all right, I'm judging this thing and I'm going to move heaven and earth to remove this from your life. You bring a verdict like that into the court of meeting and you command the enemy to be brought into the court and any demon behind, let's say there's, there's anxiety that you know is in you and fear. And you know that God's judging that. And how do you know? Well, you, you lean on God, you let him tell you and you... When God judges something, it's going to become apparent. When it's first something that's hidden in you, that you say, God, all right, get this out. I don't even know the extent of what's in me. When he starts judging that thing, you're going to identify it, and you have the Holy Spirit in you that's talking to you, so that's how you know. So let's say that God is judging fear and anxiety. So you can summon the spirits, all spirits behind fear, those assignments, and anxiety, all spirits under those assignments, under that kind of umbrella of darkness, you can say, I want them in the court, and then you lay down the law. So the court of meeting, it's not a place where you're contending against the devil so much. It's a place where you're putting God's mandates in place and telling the enemy, this is what you're going to do. This is not what you're going to do. You put him in his place and you go, boom, boom, boom. The mandate of God says this, says that. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. God says that I'm, I'm a righteous man. God says that I'm a soldier. God says that I'm a, a man of valor. You know, you arm yourself with all these prophetic words, and then you use them against that spirit. And then you say, you can even say, you know, did God not already judge on my behalf to remove this from my life? What are you doing still there? You know, there's a boldness that's available to you within the court of meeting. And how much do we say very often that, in every courtroom, there's a strategy there. You know, there, there's different strategies within different courts. And there's also different anointings, different kind of aspects of God, different aspects of who you are that comes out in these courts. This aspect is a court of boldness against the enemy. You know, the court of calling was a court where, you know, of openness where God is not going to judge you, but he's going to judge the things in you. So you isn't that a great progression? And these courts go together, the court of calling, get all that dealt with, bring the verdicts into the court of meeting, enforce all this stuff against the enemy. And because we were talking that the court of calling is a kickstarter, it kickstarts a work. Well, that work needs to progress and it needs to kind of meet um, its expected end, what God wants it to do. You know, the perfect work God does, he never stops something that he starts. He finished what, what he starts, and oftentimes there's a progression to the courts. <clears throat> so with the schedule we have with this little tour, uh, you come to the understanding that, that God's moving on your behalf. He's judging the enemy. 
And so an understanding of the courts, you know, so why do we want to use them? Why do we want to utilize them? We'll consider this in Colossians 1, starting at verse 12. Paul is praying for the church at um, Colossae. And he's writing, and this is in the book of Colossians. He's saying, Paul's praying this over the people. He's saying, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Verse 13 of Colossians 1, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. So Paul's saying God did this. God delivered us, church, from the power of darkness and conveyed us, brought us in, transitioned us into the kingdom of heaven. So we, do we need to enforce that? Is it done, set, and that's all we have to do? Well, we have to enforce it. We have to put our jurisdiction in place. We have to contend for certain things to get all of the darkness out and to bring all things into the kingdom of light. And we do this by the use of, of courts. Think about what we did within the court of calling. You know, we're talking about Colossians 1.13. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Well, what do we do? We first go to the court of calling. We petition God. God, judge these things in me. Show me what's in me. We work with God there. We linger there. We allow this work to take place. God judges something. He says, okay, I'm going to judge that darkness. I'm going to bring my light into you. I need to remove this darkness, and you're all for it. So am I. So God brings that to pass. We take that work, go into the court of meeting, and put all of that against the, any enemy that may be in us or working outside of us to keep these dark things in us. Because do you know that an enemy can be in you? An enemy can be on the outside of you, constantly playing what's outside from what's inside, causing you to be a mess, stirring you up. So we need to eliminate you know, what's in you and also what's outside. What's outside is what's linked to other parts of the kingdom of darkness. Like right now, we're in a time of great strategy to allow for a complete perfect work to take place. That includes getting whatever's in you out, exposing it to the light, have, having the kingdom of heaven and angels and everything deal with whatever's related to that. Wherever it links, wherever it goes, we want all those things. So that's why you can, like when I was talking earlier, if you're dealing with fear and anxiety, you could bring every kingdom, every demonic assignment, everything that's related and linked to that into the court to receive those verdicts. And when we do that, when we force the enemy to get sentenced and judged, that's when we see real breakthrough and, that's, and the enemy can't run from that because he gets mandates from God put on him. And then that's where our breakthrough is. So there's enemies on the outside, there's enemies on the inside. How, how did they get these positions? Well, first, let's define them. Ephesians 6, 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts in the heavenly places. In the heavenly places, okay? In the heavenly places. Now, that's not talking about the third heaven, but that's talking about the second heavens and the first heaven realm, like everything under the third heavens. Why not the third heavens? Because in Revelations 12, verse 8, it says, there was no longer any place found in heaven for the devil or his angels. He was kicked out. He was hurled down, and he became the prince of the power of the air. That's in another scripture that, he's in the, uh, that he is the prince of the power of the air. Now, what do we do with all this? We have an understanding. The enemy was put out of heaven, but he still has a place. There was no place found in heaven for him, but consider this scripture now. So, devil's, devil's kicked out of heaven. He is referred to as principalities, rulers, authorities. In his fallen state, he still is this. He's referred to as the prince of the power of the air. In Ephesians 1, starting at verse 20, it says this that God raised Jesus up from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Where is that at? Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion in every name that is named, not only in the present age, but in the one to come. So God put Jesus above all the demonic thrones, 
above all the heavenly angelic thrones, above anything that could be named, he put Jesus above that. But it's important for us, as verse 22 says of, of Ephesians 1, and God put everything under his feet and made him head over everything for the church, for all of us. We need his headship. We need to be in him, in the heavenly places, seated in the heavenly realms, like verse 20 says, we need all these things working together to be able to decree a thing to defeat the enemy because there's no place for the enemy in the third heavens and above, but there's plenty of places in the second heavens and everything else, and that's where he works against the people that God wants you to save. That's how he works against your fleshly mind. Everything that he views in this world, he has a spot. He has a position that he works from to wear you out, to throw things, and there's, there's a strategy from heaven that we really need to understand to do a perfect works. And we're kick-starting it. <clears throat> we're removing him from in us, and then we're judging him, the one in us, and then everything that links to that. So we're doing a works, you guys, from the courtroom of heaven. We're getting the enemy removed from us. We're exposing the darkness with the light. We're judging it. We're sentencing all the demons behind it, and we're understanding more and more what heaven has for us to get us out of this so that we become more and more righteous so that we have less and less come with the enemy and we become more and more made in the image of Jesus, which we were predestined to be. Everything about your destiny is about becoming more like Jesus. We were predestined to be conformed into his image. That's what it says in Romans 8. I believe it's verse 30. That's it. That kickstart. That's what the whole justification process is all about becoming more like Jesus. But in order to do that, we need to kick the devil out of our lives because they are opposite. They put stuff in you to make you less like Jesus because they what? Fear who you are in Christ. That's all they fear. Who you are in Christ, him shining through you, is their defeat, period. So God, we thank you for everything that you've done here. And you guys that uh, have, have joined me here with this introduction of the tour, this introduction of how the courts connect with each other, uh, we're, we're not done. We're just getting kicked off here, and I'll have a second part of this episode next week. Thank you for joining me, and may God bless you in all your ways.